All right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are picking up with something besides the X-Men. I feel like it's been a while since we covered anything else in Marvel Comics, right? We've done Immortal Hulk, we've done the X-Men, and I feel like that's largely been it. So what I want to do here is I want to cover Iron Man because we essentially have the return of what is one of the most powerful cosmic entities in existence, kind of, but not really. You guys will see what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's actually one of the coolest things ever, and I'm curious to see if you guys can figure it out before I tell you who it is. So this largely comes or really kind of picks up with a bit of a conflict between Iron Man and Terax. Now, Terax, as a lot of you guys know, is a long-standing villain in the history of Marvel Comics. He was at one point a Herald of Galactus. These days, he's small-time, right? You don't really see him being that big of a deal anymore. And even then, when you saw him in Hickman's uh, Avengers, the new Avengers run, he was really more of just a plot device, just kind of there for the sake of telling a story and, and so on and so forth. And that's largely been his role in Marvel Comics really since the 80s. <laughs> but Terax has taken out quite readily but one of the things that we end up learning here is that Tony Stark has left his own company, Stark Unlimited. Now, this is business as usual. We've seen this happen multiple times over the course of Marvel Comics, but the way that Christopher Cantwell's doing this is really, really cool, right? Christopher Cantwell is a guy who's currently writing Iron Man. I was a little on the fence when I heard he was taking it over. I do not regret reading it. His writing is amazing. He's, he's really, really cool with this. But one of the things that happens is he ends up getting a kind of $65 billion severance package, which is nice. And then from there, like in his fight with Terax, he ends up like like destroying a satellite, right? And then of course he gets a whole bunch of flack and a whole bunch of heat on social media. Now, one of the things that any YouTuber will tell you or social media influencer will tell you is take what people say on social media with a grain of salt. Social media is an answer to the question, what happens when people can say what they want without consequences? And social media will basically show you what people are really like, right? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, at the end of the day, Tony Stark seems to kind of get caught up in a uh, social media to a degree. But one of the things that he's also kind of, kind of criticized for and grilled for a little bit is the idea of him changing his career when he's like you know what i'm stepping away from technology completely machines should be building machines we need to get back in touch with what it means to be human and she's like when you say get back in touch with your roots are you talking about the 65 billion dollar exit package from stark unlimited a 14.8 million dollar malibu mansion and a computerized iron man suit <laughs> <laughs> That's as dangerous as a thermonuclear weapon. Is that getting back to your roots? Is that what you're referring to? Because if you're talking about becoming an average man, they don't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a funny little thing there, but social media largely seems to have it out for him, right? You know, it's kind of kind of taking it to him, but you kind of get these little tidbits here and there. He kind of packs everything up, right? He's kind of telling Rhodey, like, pack everything up, right? He's got his 1970 Boss 429 Mustang, which I always thought was kind of cool, but I'm more of a 1971 Chevelle 450 Big Block Man myself. It's my dream car. <laughs> but it's kind of this thing where Tony Stark's sort of just walking away from it all, right? Just literally leaving it all behind. And it's just like, I want to get back to a simpler life. And that kind of makes sense right? I mean, it is very difficult to look at a person who's a billionaire and see that like, you know, man, life must be a struggle for them. But it's, it's one of these things where a person's struggles aren't necessarily based on money. Oftentimes they're just based on their life experiences, right? The things they go through. And if you're somebody like Iron Man, you've never had a moment's peace and you're kind of cursed with the gift of knowledge to a degree, but you're always out there doing something, right? You're always putting your life on the line. There's all these kind of threats that go on time and time again. It makes sense that there comes a point when you're like, you know what? I just want to be done with it all, right? Just buy some brownstone and just live some measure of a peaceful life and so tony stark kind of starts to get a little bit reckless or what you would expect a guy like him to do if he's just sort of getting out there and just doing things that he always thought would be fascinating like for example getting involved in a street race now as you guys know from watching fast and the furious nothing in this world is stronger than family not even galactus family can beat galactus family can beat cosmic entities thanos would have been defeated with the infinity stones and the infinity gauntlet had family stepped in but Tony Stark kind of getting involved in these street races and so on. He's just kind of being reckless. I mean, to a degree, like he puts like five grand on the line just to get involved in a race with this guy. But while all this is happening, small little things are taking place, right? Small little moments are going on behind the scenes, robberies, break-ins. And normally Tony Stark would never really concern himself with this. But then we get the appearance of a relatively interesting character, right? He kind of tweets out that he's holding a kind of a get together with some old friends. And he ends up being met with the arrival of Patsy Walker Hellcat. Now, Patsy Walker was a a huge deal back in the day, right? Like back in the 70s and the 80s, she was a huge deal. And she's really been around for a long, long time in Marvel. But the reality is she's just kind of been small peanuts for a long time. And that's one of the things that I want you guys to notice with what Christopher Cantwell is doing here is a lot of these old school, small time guys, he's bringing them back, right? He's bringing back a lot of these old school, small time characters. And it's kind of interesting because the relationship between Patsy Walker and Iron Man is such that they had a kind of romantic interest at one point, a bit of a fling, but there's history there. But in the middle of them talking and having this conversation, Suddenly he's met by the arrival of a guy named
named Fuller Teilhard. I think is how you pronounce it. That's how I pronounce it. Or Teilhard. Whatever. This guy basically has this business proposition. Now, this is almost kind of a shot for shot of Iron Man 3. When you had uh, when he had Killian who approached Tony Stark with like, I had this really cool idea. You guys remember that whole scene from Iron Man 3? I know you guys try to block the movie out of your head, but uh, this is kind of a shot for shot moment of that. When he basically pitches this idea to him, they could really change everything, right? Capturing lightning. And the whole idea behind that is lightning is an exceedingly powerful source of energy and it's naturally occurring. So why not harness that and then basically use like waste free energy that can power the world, right? They can do all kinds of things to fix the world. Now, the reality is Tony Stark isn't necessarily against this because he's like, I mean, there's no real profit to be made here or I can't weaponize it or anything like that. It's largely because one, he's wearing fuzzy bunny slippers and two, he just doesn't really care about that kind of stuff anymore. It doesn't really seem to be relevant to him anymore. And so he's like, I mean, lightning's cool. You know, that's that's whatever. And then just kind of walks away with, with Patsy Walker. You know, this guy's kind of like, well, I mean, you know, if you ever decide to change your mind, let me know. That will be incredibly important. And the reason why is because Iron Man getting back to his roots is not necessarily him walking away from the role of Iron Man. And in fact, he actually breaks out a vintage suit from back in the day when he was simply just the Golden Avenger, right? An old school Iron Man suit. That in the eyes of Tony Stark, there's almost a kind of level of humanity that's lost with the advent of technology. And there's really no one better to make that case than him, right? The average person on Twitter is not equipped to make that case. A futurist, a person who's developed some of the most advanced technologies in the world, and in fact, the foremost authority on technology is equipped to make that argument because he understands the full breadth of what technology has done for and to society and what it will lead to. That's one of the things to keep in mind. Iron Man's always been a futurist, right? Tony Stark has always looked to the future. He builds for tomorrow. He doesn't build for today. And that's why technologically, even comparing him to people like Reed Richards or like Wakanda or something like that, he's usually always a step ahead of them. It's one of the things that was established during and at the end of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run is that in comparison to everybody else out there, T'Challa, Reed Richards, all these guys, even Peter Parker to a degree, or even Dr. Octopus, Iron Man's ahead of all of them, right? Just in terms of his ability to develop technologies. The only thing that limits him is the technology around him, right? What he can build based on the existing resources that he has. But if he were to go to Wakanda and he had all the resources in Wakanda, it would dwarf everything that Wakanda's built already. I mean, Wakanda never really had the ability to build a Dyson Sphere. Tony Stark did, right? To literally build one around the sun. It was one of the most monumental achievements and he had to use alien technology in order to pull it off. It's one of these things where he kind of sits down and he has this bit of a conversation with Patsy Walker and he starts out kind of kind of having this bit of an existential crisis. I don't really know who I am anymore. When she asked the question, like, what's the whole point behind this, right? What's the whole idea behind leaving technology behind, walking away from Stark Unlimited and then living more of a peaceful life and just kind of going back to the days when it was just you and Iron Man and that was basically it. What's the point behind all this, right? Why are you even hanging out with me? Like we haven't hung out in forever. And the response of Tony is, I don't know who I am anymore, right? I don't really know what my deal is anymore. I don't know my purpose in all of this, right? An existential crisis on behalf of Tony Stark. And that's when in the middle of all this, they suddenly realize that Unicorn is, is launching a heist. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're probably asking your question, who's Unicorn? And rightfully so. Unicorn hasn't been relevant in decades. And when I say decades, I mean decades. But Uni Unicorn is a guy with super strength, right? He can lift something like 15 tons, if my memory serves me correctly. He's pretty powerful, right? He's a very, he's a, he's a strong character. But he is, if there was something lower than a Z-list villain, it would be him. <laughs> but the crazy thing is, the whole time he's doing this, he keeps referencing a guy called The Other, right? And he's literally stolen this book from a library of all places, right? And it's like, why? Why would this guy break into a library and steal a book? But the other thing is there's a bit of a few kind of enhancements here, enough that he's able to really hold his own against Iron Man, kind of subdue him for a second and then ultimately escape, but not before Iron Man basically, you know, knocks down the helicopter, sends a crash into the ground, and then basically, you know, Unicorn is arrested, and Iron Man realizes what he's stolen here is the Gutenberg Bible. Now, this is the weirdest thing to steal, because the significance of the Gutenberg Bible is it was the first book that was printed with the Gutenberg Press, which started the process of just mass-producing books using machinery. But the fact that this is being stolen by some guy like Unicorn, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's like, why, like, you know, why would you do this? And who's the other, right? Who's this being that you're referring to? And so what you end up doing is you actually switch over to this guy that, that Iron Man had been talking to previously, and this guy's just kind of standing in a window staring out. Now, if you look at this bottom panel here, anybody who knows anything about the history of Marvel Comics will be able to tell you right off the bat who this guy is, right? If you ever read the history of Marvel, I mean, the, it, the artwork tells you who this guy is, but for those of you guys who are unsure, and those of you guys who have not been able to guess it yet, you pick up one year prior to all of this, and basically this, this system is kind of brought online, right? This being 
king is basically brought online by the enclave now those of you guys who don't really know what the enclave is they are significant right they're hugely significant the enclave were the ones who basically developed adam warlock the idea behind the enclave is basically they're a collection of scientists who want to run the world right who want to like conquer the world focusing on like science and technology as opposed to having some kind of nefarious purpose right they're not really looking to be like you know dictators that rule the world with an iron fist they just kind of believe that humanity is its problem and that forcing humanity to exist on a more scientific and, and technological level would basically make the world better the other part of this is that this guy's referred to as adam four again kind of picking up from the adam warlock project that adam warlock would be referred to as adam one and they've had various attempts over the years to duplicate adam warlock right kismet is a perfect example of that but this guy says do not call me adam call me by my real name korvac so this is kind of a crazy thing the return of michael korvac and they ask like what's your mission and it's like you know something about saving the enclave i don't know but your mission is selfish right like and this is this is one of the coolest th coolest things he says here he says what makes humans so arrogant as to think their world is more important than any other why make the world a better place why not make the universe a better place a better reality for everybody who's here and this guy responds and says you're a cybernetic amalgamation you're superior opinions on these matters are beneath you it's your nearly unlimited intellect that is required and before he can finish he says it's my nearly unlimited intellect that tells me this universe is a landfill that is conflict laden and war torn by the greedy it tells me that this is a reality that while filled with those proclaiming to be gods is ultimately godless and lost and ultimately it tells me that i am but mere steps away from becoming the god that it needs you can have your enclave i have bigger plans and i must begin immediately now this is the bane of the existence when it comes to the enclave when they originally made adam warlock they had to fly in alicia masters right the blind girlfriend of ben Grimm, because the light emitting from adam warlock was too bright for them to see and they had to know if their experiment was a success but almost immediately after adam warlock emerged he, he turned against the enclave fought alongside the fantastic four and then bolted and then he kidnapped sif and tried to marry her which is kind of weird but it's the the bane of the existence of the enclave that every organism that they either manufacture or alter ends up turning against them because honestly despite the the fact that they exist based on the beliefs of science and technology they defy logic and reason in terms of their motivation and why they want to do what they do and so switching back over to iron man suddenly he's basically caught up in murder world right now we don't really know exactly how we got here and even iron man says i don't know how i'm here it's just him and crusher creel that were snatched up and brought to this place and crusher creel's like look if i have to destroy you in order to get out of here and that's exactly what i'll do iron man ends up figuring out that it was basically arcade and then of course once he unmasks arcade they end up freeing themselves and so on but this is going towards the kind of continued crushing of iron man as far as public opinion goes that iron man is doing things that the general public doesn't like and so the general public is turning against him whether it's logical or reasonable is irrelevant right that it doesn't really matter whether or not what people believe is logical and reasonable it's just what they believe and people will steadfast their beliefs and very rarely ever change them unless they absolutely have to and it's only really in the face of conflict or destruction that they have to change their opinions but you end up having this kind of situation over and over and over again this is what's happening time and time again there's these different villains that are showing up here right one guy kidnaps a whole bunch of guys from stark unlimited and tony stark has to go in and save them you know it's, it's just this kind of situation this kind of process that repeats itself continually that you end up having iron man who basically kind of saves the day albeit you know with a few dangers here and there he breaks his bones right he has like 17 fractures you know he's like his left lung is punctured and so on and so forth but like kind of enduring these struggles over and over and over again it's just kind of the nature of of the current situation that iron man is in because at the end of the day korvac has some kind of plan under his belt and all these these guys that are being brought in is being done for the purpose of serving this plan now the question is why because the next thing you see is iron man who faces off against the melter and the melter just like melts his car and it's, it's a weird thing right it's almost like these guys are kind of playing games with him screwing up his head you know just kind of appearing out of nowhere it's just kind of small time stuff you would normally never see iron man engage in a conflict like this with these small time guys but for some reason or another they're all being brought together by korvac for the purpose of facing off against iron man unlike michael korvac in you know as he originally appeared in the sense that he was just basically a lazy guy right existing in a future that was ruled by the badoon instead like he's more or less been kind of either recreated manufactured whatever and is just kind of going off his own schemes that make sense to himself and just basically seeking godhood and that's what he tells tony stark that ultimately we find out that tony stark backed the experiment of this guy not knowing it was korvac and in doing that this entire process plays out the way this guy intended it to where essentially he kind of invites iron man here iron man's like okay i want to see what 
what my investment bought me. And then as soon as that goes on, he's immediately hit by lightning, right? Taken out by this, by, by Korvac. And then Korvac brings together the other guys that have, that have more or less been freed, right? Unicorn's been freed, the controllers here, but it's just kind of this thing over and over where they're like, we're going to take you out, right? I got these three guys because they seem to be the most equipped in taking you on. Now, this again is another kind of reflection of the old school Korvac stories, because the reality is these guys are not a challenge for Iron Man and they never really were. Iron Man was able to overcome them pretty readily. I mean, guys like the controller are kind of powerful, but they're all B or C list villains. And so it really seems more of an indication that Korvac is kind of learning as he goes along. And that was the nature of the original Korvac. Once he stole the power of Galactus and was almost really more machine than man, even in the events leading up to that, he was kind of figuring things out as he was doing that. And that's why the Korvac saga is so cool because you see this guy who's basically lazy, who's turned into a machine, who steals the power of Galactus, who comes back to the modern day, and then basically just kind of becomes more and more of a credible threat as the story goes on, all the way up until the point where he reaches godhood. And that's what this guy's trying to do. That's why him and Korvac are really linked in this way as he's just kind of like seemingly a remade version or returned version of Korvac because he says, I'm not looking to achieve demigod level status. I'll do that here in a moment, right? I'll achieve this kind of demigod level of power where I'm at right now, but I'm looking to attain full on godhood. That's his mission. That's his goal because that's what the original Michael Korvac did. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Iron Man. Yes, we are. You guys really seem to love the video that we did. We were doing like the books of Korvac and the return of Michael Korvac in Marvel Comics, which admittedly is pretty awesome. But coming out of the last video that we did, right? You had basically Patsy Walker and Iron Man who were taken out by Korvac. And at this point, it's just kind of recovery. But in the midst of all that, you basically have a couple things that go down. The first is that you have these kind of words that are whispered in the ear of Patsy Hellcat, right? Pray to the one for salvation, pray to the one for redemption, pray to the one for benediction just kind of these words being whispered in her ear over and over again and james rhodes has also gone missing now for iron man himself a lot of what's going on is kind of backlash because well i mean because it's iron man right i mean like when is tony stark ever not screwing up in marvel comics you know what i mean i feel like ever since the events of civil war everybody's got it out for tony stark he's just always making mistakes but more so than that petsy walker is basically dealing with the aftermath of all this and the fact that she's got fractal burns along her face as a result of the lightning that she was struck by now of course there's a couple you know offers that are made by by stark and so far as saying well maybe reed richards or somebody can tend to it and you know keep it from scarring or whatever the case is but the reality is that's not really what's bothering patsy what's really bothering her is these voices that are kind of going in her head now one of the things that's kind of hit on here and one of the things that kind of belongs to the history of her character is the idea of schizophrenia uh it was one of the things that marvel focused on in an effort to try to beef her up and make her more interesting which is a little weird when it comes to it honestly it didn't work uh patsy walker has never really been an interesting character in marvel nothing against the nature of her character personally it's just that her stories were never really compelling and so i just never really had an interest in her at least that's just my take anyway you might you know find it a little more intriguing but one of the other things that's really concerning here for tony stark is the nature of korvac and it's really one of the things that's kind of hit on here from avengers 177 back in the day which was the korvac saga right the idea that michael korvac was basically a regular human from from like the future of a different universe where the badoon had conquered everything and then in turn because he was terrible at his job he was you know kind of hooked up to a machine and then basically ended up taking over the power of galactic came up to the modern era and then basically made himself a cosmic entity, right? So, you know, Michael Korvac has a history of being this ridiculously OP character. And in fact, in the Korvac saga, he killed everybody, right? He brought him back to life, but he killed everybody. And that's one of the things that Patsy Walker hits on. And she's like, look, I kind of get where you're coming from here. You know, like he was a cosmic entity and Tony Stark's like, yeah, I mean, now he's just kind of an android, but there's legitimate concern here, right? Because she's like, it was, it was, you know, at that point when you guys fought him, he destroyed all of you. And the only reason you came back is because he brought you back. And that's true, right? Like, like literally Michael Korvac saved the day himself and was just kind of like, no, this isn't really how it's meant to be. And then just set everything back to normal and then just kind of destroyed himself and, and wiped himself out of existence. But literally the bad guy won by all standards of measurement. It's one of the things that made the Korvac saga so significant back in the day. But ultimately it, you end up switching over to, to James Rhodes himself, uh, you know, in the, the outer barrows of New York. And essentially he's just kind of being held captive by Michael Korvac by way of the controller himself. Now the controller, we've talked about him before over the years in Marvel comics, the controller, 
controller basically has these little control discs that he puts on people and they basically bend them to his whim. The biggest issue with this is that the willpower of James Rhodes is high. And it's one of the things that's been hit on for years in Marvel Comics, that there's just something about James Rhodes that kind of makes him a cut above the rest with everybody else. And so while the controller has three discs on this guy, James Rhodes, while I wouldn't say that he can do whatever he wants to, he's still able to maintain some measure of autonomy and it shouldn't necessarily be that way, right? It's one of these things where it's kind of like, I mean, this guy should be completely and totally bent to my control under these discs, but this guy's willpower is nuts. And a lot of that comes from James Rhodes' own personal experiences, as well as having been Iron Man, fought alongside Tony Stark, faced off against some very heavy hitters, some of which have the ability of telepathy or the ability to dominate the wills of others. And so over these years, he's developed a kind of conditioning, even if not outright mental blocks, that basically make it very, very difficult for a person out there to dominate his will or to subjugate him. And that's why, while he's not able to completely resist the powers of the controller, he's able to put up one hell of a fight, if we're being honest with ourselves. And so at the end of the day, it's one of these things where Korvac having this kind of conversation with him is really more of, in the end, you will bend to my will. And even if you don't, it won't matter because once I've reached to where I need to go, at the end of the day, I'm gonna be able to conquer the universe anyway. So it doesn't matter whether you agree with me because in the end, I will rule everything, right? I will control all. And so what you end up having here, at least the kind of goal of Korvac is that in its current form, he doesn't have the power to leave Earth and reach his final destination, which is actually the ship of Ta-2, of, uh, of Galactus's world ship. What he needs is a kind of power boost. He needs the ability to have the, the power to leave the Earth and then storm Galactus's ship. And so what he's done is he's hooked himself up to what is essentially a giant power supply that'll allow him to tap into the city's power grid and then drain the entire electrical source of the city itself into him. And while that may not seem like the most significant thing, remember, one of the things to understand is that Korvac is by and large a machine. And so this is one of those examples where Christopher Cantwell is building into the idea that a machine that controls an electrical grid or can tap into an electrical grid can kind of expand that to its near limitless potential. And that's exactly what happens. That once he's hooked up and once he absorbs the city's electrical power into himself, that now when, when everything goes down, right, the whole ship goes down, that with Patsy Walker kind of hearing these words of Michael Korvac whispering in her ear, she picks up on the idea that he's pursuing Ta-2. And that's when Iron Man really begins to freak because he's like, wait a minute, did you say Ta-2? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, that's Galactus's world ship. Like, oh my God. So like with the power going down, that's when he realizes that Korvac's tapping into the power grid and basically following this, he can control all the electrons on Earth, right? He can literally control the Earth, the entire world's electrical grid. Now, this is not the most important thing in the world, but it is a significant thing because it's like it's like having the abilities of Storm. When with Storm, she can control the weather on any world she's on. With Michael Korvac, it's the exact same thing now. Being able to manipulate the electric particles that exist out there or electrons, being able to manipulate those on Earth is being able to manipulate those anywhere else. This is this is more or less akin to like when Neo in the Matrix was downloading knowledge of Kung Fu into his body. Now that Korvac can do it here, he can do it anywhere, which includes Galactus' ship. And so that's the idea is to get there and then because Galactus' ship runs on energy and electrons, in turn, he'd be able to take over the ship itself. It's basically what he did in the first appearance that he had when he first took over and downloaded everything in Galactus' ship and gave himself the power cosmic. And so ultimately, you end up having Iron Man who goes to visit Halkion. Now, you guys might recall Halkion as the street racer that Iron Man faced off against when he was just going crazy and spinning money like a wild man. But Halkion is one of these guys who, of course, one, uh, is deaf, therefore he uses sign language. But two, because of the fact that he is kind of an underground guy insofar as illegal street racing, tapping into the underworld, you know, kind of passing information back and forth. He's the closest Iron Man has to an actual like underworld team. What he needs is something a little more complex. The problem with this is he can't just sound the alarm to everybody, right? He can't go out to like the, the X-Men. He can't go to the Fantastic Four. He can't go to the Avengers because the condition of what it is that Michael Korbeck is doing is if you tell anybody what's going on, I will kill James Rhodes. Having to basically go underground and seeing Tony Stark having to operate without the help of like Avengers who will easily save the day. It's cool because it forces the story to be written in a way where it focuses on Iron Man in a capacity that you don't normally see. The problem is that in the middle of all this, a way in is a way out. If Patsy Walker can overhear Michael Korvac, Michael Korvac can control Patsy Walker. And that's what happens. He basically takes over the body of Patsy and literally tells Tony Stark, do not try to stop me, right? Like, do not try to get in the way of what it is that I'm doing. Now, of course, in the middle of all this is with all the chaos and all the pandemonium, everybody's freaking out. You literally have Halkion who just like picks up a hubcap, walks over to uh, to a fire hydrant, smashes off the, the top of it and just blasts Patsy Walker with water. And like, that's it. He's as calm as a cucumber. We end up finding out that's his mutant power is that his heartbeat never goes above 70 BPM. Now, here's one of the cool things, man. That's a genius ability to have. If your heart rate never goes 
over 70 BPM, you never panic, right? Adrenaline never kicks in. You never run into any of that stuff. Instead, you're always calm. And if you're calm, you can think clearly. And if you can think clearly, you can win, right? And that's kind of the cool thing. So switch over to Iron Man after he had gotten a hold of, of Halcyon and gave him a list of people that he needed. And we end up finding out this list of people. It's amazing, right? So you've got Gargoyle. Gargoyle doesn't matter. You got Scarlet Spider, which is awesome to see here. You've got Misty Knight. And then you have Frogman, Eugene Petilio. This guy sucks, but his stories, or at least his origin is kind of cool, right? So Eugene Petilio, he was a Marvel team up character. He originally appeared in Marvel team up in issue 121. He actually teamed up with Spider-Man and with uh, the Human Torch to any, any like accidentally defeated Speed Demon. And then when he defeated Speed Demon, he was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm amazing. And then like went forward and tried to be a superhero, but basically had a terrible career. But I love Frogman. I would love to read a solo series about Frogman. I doubt it would sell well. It would last like six issues and then Marvel would cancel it, but I would love it. <laughs> it would be amazing. The reality is this is a hodgepodge team, man. Like this is, this is by no means the goal that Tony Stark wanted, but at the end of the day, he has to work with what he can, where he can. Now the true benefit in having this group really comes in the form of Misty Knight, because as you guys recall, she's the leader of Heroes for Hire, or at least she has been over the years, but she's also developed a lot of contacts. And so these are people that can feed her information that cannot readily be accessed by anybody in the superhero community. It's one of the aspects of Marvel Comics that you never really get to see explored all that often, unless you're actually reading Heroes for Hire or something that has to do with Misty Knight. But there's a whole underground network, as grand and great as the superheroes are, you know, the Avengers and all those guys, there are times when criminals will go underground and like, they'll never be able to find them because anybody who could give them information doesn't trust them, but they do trust Misty Knight, but they do trust Luke Cage, they trust Iron Fist, people like that, people who are on the ground level. And a lot of that is built into the notion that because of the fact that these superheroes fight on the ground level in the same way these average people do, that it's kind of like, you know, like they're one of us. Whereas when they look at Iron Man, they look at Captain America, they look at Thor, they look at those guys, they're like, they're not one of us, right? Like they're way up there. They see themselves as better existing in their ivory tower and Avengers tower and just kind of a cut above the rest of the world. They see those, those high level superheroes is in a lot of ways being kind of haughty, right? And so that's why you don't really see like Iron Man being able to get a hold of the same contacts that Misty Knight has. Now he does have his own to a degree, but at the end of the day, none of it really seems to work out. And so what you end up having here, these kind of acolytes, so to speak of, of Michael Korvac, they all kind of band together in front of this, this giant ship. And he's like, okay, like grab James Rhodes and, uh, and like everything that we need will be done in an hour. And we basically need to get the attention of Iron Man here. And so what you end up doing is you basically pick up with the, the team of Iron Man, right? Like you pick up with Misty Knight and all them who basically come to this realization that there is a, a kind of power source, uh, out in the dock somewhere that basically had a high level of, of radiation or energy that emanated from it. And so because of that, that's like, that's their source, right? That's where they need to go in order to find Korvac or at the very least find whatever it is that has to do with Korvac. And so ultimately you end up having this location traced down by Iron Man as it's given to him by Misty Knight. And when he gets there, or at least gets to a spot, uh, you know, kind of following Patsy Walker, that basically these people come running out saying that like, there's a guy in, a, in the laundromat with a bomb, right? And of course, Michael Korvac doesn't actually have a bomb. He was looking to just kind of get everything sorted out with him and Tony Stark, at least, you know, get Tony to not necessarily be on his side, but at the very least to understand that Korvac's going to win. Now, this is the thing to understand here. Korvac's not trying to get Iron Man to his side. He's not trying to preach to him that like, what I'm actually doing is the right thing. It's really one of these things of like, the, like what I'm doing here is going to work, right? Like whether you want it to or not, I will succeed here. And there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop me. He's like, I've already imbued myself with half the energy of earth, right? I don't, you know, there's nothing you can do to stop me here, right? Like not you, not the Avengers. At the moment right now, I'm already more powerful than all of you. I am looking to achieve godhood and I will bring unity to this universe that's already so fractured and broken. What this universe needs is a singular God under which it can either rally or it can be forced to rally. It can be forced to bend the knee. But one way or the other, I will be the one who rules everything, right? He's talking like a tyrannical dictator kind of guy. And so what you end up having while all that's going on is Misty Knight and her guys who were tasked with going and finding that Shi'ar jump ship, which they successfully do. The problem is once they get in there, it's completely empty. There's nothing in there. And Tony Stark immediately putting two and two together is like, no, get out of there. And like immediately, boom, the ship explodes, right? Takes all those guys out. And it's like, holy sh**. Like it's, it's, that's crazy, right? Like, like literally it was a bomb that was set up by, uh, by Michael Korvac. And that's the big difference between Korvac and Tony Stark. Korvac is just that much smarter than he is. And even when Korvac first showed up, right, he was a master intellect across the universe. And while Tony Stark wouldn't necessarily give himself that level of credit, he is a futurist. He is exceedingly intelligent, but Korvac in all of his appearances has always just been that much more intelligent than Tony Stark. But nonetheless, Korvac in, in when he was really a credible threat to the Avengers has always been wildly intelligent. 
intelligent. And so as, as smart as Tony Stark is in comparison to the average person, Michael Korvac is that much more intelligent than Tony Stark. And being able to outmatch him like this, being able to outclass him and just be like, you never really had a chance in the first place. Like understand Tony Stark, I've been running circles around you since this whole thing began. Tony Stark lashes out, attacks Korvac and uses every ounce of energy that his that his suit can, can muster. Now, something to understand here, this is also an old school suit of Iron Man. So by no means is this Cantwell saying like, this is Iron Man in his peak capacity using every ounce of energy he has and the best suit of armor he has and he still couldn't take out Michael Korvac. No, I mean, that's one of the things we covered in the last video is that it's a, it's a vintage suit, right? It's not his most up-to-date technical suit. If you were to face off and use every ounce of energy that was available in something like the Endosim suit from Superior Iron Man, he may have stood a chance in taking out Korvac here, but at the very least, it doesn't matter. The result is that it's not enough. And so with him completely and totally drained, the response of Korvac is, Tony Stark's out of the picture. There's nobody for us to worry about anymore. Like, get on board the ship. We're on our way to Tatu. We're going to go meet Galactus and we're going to go take over all the cosmic power that he has. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Iron Man. Yes, we are. The Books of Korvac Part 2. And this one, we're just going to cover the whole volume, right? We're not going to worry about splitting it in a little section, things like that. But coming out of the last video that we did, basically Korvac had launched an attack against Patsy Walker and Iron Man and essentially incapacitated them both, which is just kind of a sheer display of the power of Michael Korvac. So much so that Tony Stark's entire suit is just shut down, right? I mean, it's just, it's literally been overloaded. The rest of the team, right? So like Misty Knight and Frogman, Fro I love Frogman. So like Frogman, Gargoyle, those guys, they're all kind of recovering. They were able to help sort of guard people a little bit. Gargoyle's kind of recovering himself, right? Just because of the fact that he lost a wing, sustained huge injuries, different things like that. It's basically recovery time. And so when you end up picking back up with Tony Stark, uh, what you end up getting here is this, this really cool moment where they basically start to kind of work on him as best they can, but they can't really do a whole lot. And the reason why is because of the injury that he sustained. This is one of those interesting things about Iron Man's suit is that if they were to move him, they would like his, his neck is like one bad position away from killing him, right? It's already broken, right? So in order to keep him stabilized, it's like having a neck harness in the form of a suit. They have to actually modify the collar on his suit so his body doesn't move. And it's one of the crazy things because he's like, under any normal circumstance, he would have this tended to, they would get it taken care of. But Michael Korvac trying to return to power is no small thing. Now, again, because of the fact that this is an Iron Man story, under any normal circumstance, you would have him enlist the aid of the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, the whole nine yards. But Christopher Cantwell is going in the direction of saying like, this is just a Tony Stark story. So is Tony Stark just dealing with it on his own? So obviously this seems like it's going to end in such a way to where Korvac's going to obviously be defeated and he's not going to become some massive calamity, right? Some universal wide threat or anything along those lines. But in the midst of all this, suddenly they're met by the arrival of James Rhodes. And James Rhodes is kind of the voice of reason here, right? Donning the war machine suit. He's like, look, we got to get the Avengers in on this. And the response of Stark is that's not going to happen, right? I mean, you do have one of the henchmen of Korvac who shows up, tries to instigate a fight. He gets taken out pretty quickly. But the whole idea behind James Rhodes is fun. If this is really going to be the case, and this is just going to be a you, I've got to take care of it on my own. This is a personal vendetta kind of thing. Then that's fine. Like at the very least, I can come along and make sure that you don't get yourself killed, right? That kind of a thing. Now, again, people will kind of look at that and say, it's a little weird that the Cantwell's turning this, what is basically a character who is a cosmic entity, right? Michael Korvac at the peak of his power was wildly powerful. He could reshape the universe as he so chose based on his use of the power cosmic, right? The power of Galactus. A lot of people will look at that and say, it's weird that Cantwell's just turning this into an Iron Man story. I think it's cool. I think it's cool to have a character who is such a massive cosmic level threat that's not turning into yet another big crossover event in Marvel Comics, right? Where crossover events happen all the time, but instead is being held in the, the kind of capacity where it's facing off against Iron Man. This is old school, right? This is like 1970s, 1980s Marvel Comics. So while I'm not necessarily some old school hipster and I wish things could go back to the way they were 50 years ago, I don't. I do like the idea <laughs> that we get this, these, these kind of little moments here where you get these small stories where what would normally be a giant Avengers class threat, probably even a universal threat involving a whole host of spacefaring characters and everything, instead of just being dealt with by Iron Man. So there's a couple things that you get here, which is kind of cool. You end up, of course, getting them, you know, boarding Tony Stark's ship, basically taking off after Michael Korvac. Uh, War Machine gets a giant upgrade, so does Tony Stark. We're not really given the definitive nature of War Machine's upgrade. We're just told that he gets one, and that's, that's really kind of it. But you actually have this really cool moment where you end up having Patsy Walker, who's basically brought in 
alongside Tony Stark by Michael Korvac, of course, using his, his powers and so on, basically kind of communicates to them that like this sort of lush planet, right? This lush, beautiful planet is, is kind of a physical manifestation, a representation of the utopia that he wants to bring to the universe. And again, this is one of the things that we talk about in like injustice and different things like that, that if humanity and even just the entirety of the universe's denizens wanted the universe to be a better place, it would be. But the fact that it's not is an indication to the fact that they don't want it to be, whether it's by their own inaction or their direct action in keeping that from happening, apathy or intentional cause. The result is that people want things to be bad. And so at the end of the day, Korvac is kind of a really appearing him, you know, as this kind of guy that's saying, look, the universe is going to become a better place, whether you want it to or not, right? Like war, disease, famine, all that kind of stuff, hate, fear, it's all going away. I know a lot of you guys want it to stay, but it's not going to, right? It's all going to be eliminated. And it's kind of a funny thing because one of the things that we've seen is like in the face of that, superheroes almost stand in the way of making things better, right? That if the world and the universe is a crappy place because people out there want it to be, then in turn, superheroes saying, no, they should have the right to choose whether or not the universe is good or bad. Standing in the face of the guy who's going to say like, I'm using all this power to make the world a better place is in effect standing in the way of making the universe a better place, right? So they're literally working against progress. Like they're literally working against uh, the universe becoming a utopia. The argument that they argue that they really present here is no one person can have that power. And the argument that's really presented here is based on Michael Korvac's previous escapades, which is his desire to kind of lay waste to everything, so on and so forth, which was not necessarily true. The funny thing about this is that Michael Korvac is more machine than man. So he's not really encumbered by emotion. And really emotion is the source of virtually every bad decision anybody's ever made, right? Emotional decisions are inherently bad decisions. Logical decisions are inherently the best decisions, right? What's best for the greatest number of people? The greatest number of people having peace and prosperity and not having to worry about pain and suffering, that's what's best for the universe. <laughs> so we're gonna do that, right? It's, 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 a, it's an interesting concept, right? It really is this kind of, you know, freedom versus security argument that's being presented here. And so because what you get is Iron Man and, and essentially Patsy Walker standing in the face of that, the whole thing is just kind of dispersed and Iron Man is just teleported to some weird location, right? Just kind of sent away where he's met by what's called the Colony Patrol. Now we'll talk about them here in a little bit, but what you end up doing here is switching over and, and really picking up with like Korvac and his guys chasing after, you know, James Rhodes and, you know, trying to destroy their ship so they can't get in the way of his mission and, and all that kind of crazy stuff. But in the midst of all that, suddenly Patsy Walker is met by a telepathic communication, which actually turns out to be coming from Moondragon. Now, Heather Douglas is interesting. Heather Douglas is cool. She's probably one of the more important characters in the history of Marvel Comics. <laughs> she is a hugely powerful telepath, right? She has all kinds of wild abilities, at least on a telepathic level. And really, depending on who's been writing the story over the years, if you go and you look at the old school, like Jim Starlin stuff, she was telepathically powerful on a universal scale, right? If you look at the more recent stories like Dan Abnett, Annihilation, Annihilation Conquest, she's not necessarily on that same level of power, but she still is immensely powerful. More so than that, her and Patsy Walker have an interesting relationship in the sense that in years past when Patsy Walker had these powers and it basically started driving her insane, that Moondragon was the one who shut those powers off. And so what Moondragon has done is realizing that because Korvac is returning here, they really really kind of need all hands on deck. And Patsy Walker's ability to emanate telepathic abilities, or at the very least, to ride the radio waves of telepathic powers is exceedingly important here. And in fact, that's actually what saves the day. Because while you do get this whole thing where you get like the backstory of Patsy Walker, none of it really matters, her powers are basically woken up, right? And so when you have Korvac and these guys who are basically chasing down James Rhodes and all them, she uses her powers to essentially spawn illusions in the face of Michael Korvac of the Badoon, right? Like his really is his worst fear in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about why here in a second but spawns, you know, illusions of the Badoon, which really distract Korvac and everybody else enough to where they basically stop dead in their tracks, which gives James Rhodes and everybody the ability to kind of fire up their engines and take off as fast as they can, right? Now, following that, you kind of pick up with this whole Korvac thing, right? There's this whole really discussion with, with Korvac. So this really starts in the year 2997, right? The Korvac is from the far-flung future and technically an alternate reality, depending on how you want to look at it. But the important thing is that by this point in time, the Badoon have conquered a huge section of of the, of the universe and have actually set their sights on Earth. And so what you had at that point was essentially a rebel faction, right? These kind of individuals out there who were looking to stop the Badoon from essentially conquering Earth. At that point, a lot of humanity or at least some portion of humanity worked for the Badoon, really more as servants and slaves than anything else. But the big thing is that Korvac shows up here as part of their ranks and then kills them all, only to find out that he's working for the Badoon, right? He's working directly for them. And that has essentially, you know, eliminated this kind of faction, this, this you know, uh, really rebel regiment to ensure that there's no real resistance, nobody to warn Earth that an invasion of 
the Badoon is coming. Now, again, at this point in time, Korvac was really just an employee, right? I mean, we're really just like a servant working for the Badoon themselves. And so what ended up happening is that because he abandoned his station and didn't do what he was supposed to, right? Didn't stay there. What they ended up doing was taking his human components and basically merging them with cybernetic components. And so he was one part man, one part machine. He was a cyborg and he had the ability to interface with the machines. This was the explanation Marvel provided as to how he became as powerful as he was. That in the original Michael Korvac saga, way back in the way back in the day in Marvel, that what he did is he actually traveled to the world ship of Galactus to talk to and then quote unquote downloaded the power cosmic. And that's what made him so powerful. That's what he's looking to do again, right? So this is not Michael Korvac who's been recreated as a character who just kind of exists, right? Just kind of a, a copy of his of his former self. This is actually Michael Korvac who's been brought back. And that's kind of a cool thing. Now, something that's a little wonky is that along the way to the, the world ship of Galactus, they're kind of recruiting allies. And one of the places they, they travel to is this world that's largely kind of been, been far flung and cast off, only to find the original human torch, Jim Hammond. Now, the events that led to him being here really come out of like the Invaders comics. We haven't really covered those, although they are pretty good. We may cover them at some future point in time. But one of the big changes that kind of comes out of this, one of the things that's kind of given here is that with Korvac, it's kind of a weird blend. Michael Korvac was basically reinstated or brought back by the Enclave who created Adam Warlock and called him Adam, but they call Korvac Adam One. And the weird thing here is that, that Korvac basically refers to Jim Hammond as essentially being Adam Four. And so in essence, it's almost as though Cantwell is kind of blending the old Phineas Horton origin for creating Jim Hammond with like the Enclave and creating Adam Warlock, almost kind of blending them together. Now, as far as I'm aware, Phineas Horton was never part of the Enclave. He never joined the Enclave, right? He was not really hell-bent on, on trying to conquer the world through science. If anything, he was just obsessed with getting credit for having created the first android. But regardless of how you how you slice it here, because of the fact that Jim Hammond is an android, Korvac approaches him because he believes he's best suited to truly understand what the mission of Korvac is, right? Korvac's desire to bring peace and prosperity. And so what you end up having is the two of them traveling together, and Korvac, of course, upgrades the body of Jim Hammond, giving him enhanced abilities, but then at the same time, hooks him up to a, to a system that basically allows him to process and to see what it is that Korvac is looking to do. Now, the two of their minds are connected, right? Because as machines, they can transfer information back and forth in the same way you transfer information from a computer to a USB drive. And so what this does is it basically shows the, the kind of Korvac events whereby the Avengers approach and they ask him about what's going on, you know, and they try to stop him from what it is that he's doing. And he basically ends up killing the Avengers in the process. And one of the things is that when this happens, Jim Hammond turns on him. And again, this is kind of a funny thing because the reality is whenever you're instituting a giant cause like this, right? Like bringing peace and prosperity to those who don't want it, they're going to try to stop it. And so as a result of that, you're going to have to move them out of the way, right? There are going to be forces out there that were going to be roadblocks in your way. And ultimately, if the ends truly do justify the means and because of their own natures, they're incapable of seeing it, then you just have to get rid of them, right? You literally just, that's the only thing that you can do. If you cannot convince them, if you cannot get them to understand where you're coming from, if you try everything you can, which is literally what quarterback has been doing. And at the end of the day, they just refuse to accept the reality of the situation, then the only alternative is to eliminate them, right? To remove them from the equation and then continue on your goal to peace and prosperity. It's literally happened across the entirety of, of civilization. And so because of this, Korvac comes to this realization that Jim Hammond will never really ally himself with him. And so where a controller disc is put on Hammond to kind of keep him under control, it really is a little crushing to Korvac because he wasn't looking for a servant, right? He wasn't looking for a slave. He was looking for an ally, somebody that could truly understand where he was coming from and truly help him help him achieve this goal. And so it's kind of an interesting thing here because having the power of Jim Hammond is no small thing, right? The original Human Torch. This guy's not necessarily on the same power level as the Human Torch Johnny Storm, but he is pretty damn powerful, right? He's pretty capable. And so what you end up doing is switching over to this planet that Iron Man is currently on. And one of the funny things here is that as he's in this world and as he's there spending time with these people, he of course comes across a woman by the name of Yar, who's basically the one that leads the show. Now, Yar doesn't have any real existing history in Marvel. She's a new creation for this story, but the environment and the way this whole place exists, it really is by all standards of measurement what you would define as a communist society, right? There's no money here, right? There's no real no real income or anything like that. There's simply resources and those who share them. Now, truth to tell, if this society grew large enough, you would either run into a barter system that would evolve into money or it would just turn straight into money, right? You look at like any, any political philosopher out there and they will tell you when you go from a state of nature, which is what this is, to an organized society, then somehow or another money's going to get involved, right? It's just it's just the nature of, of us as the human race. We're primitive, right? We are, are pretty primitive and pretty basic, and we haven't quite figured out that there's more important things in the world.
world in cash. So because of that, <laughs> the, the whole thing is that Tony Stark kind of experiences this sense of belonging that he never really experienced before, right? This sense of community, camaraderie. He even goes as far as to say, I never got along with the Avengers this well. It's kind of a funny thing. Now, one of these guys is also Colin Richards, also known as Avro X. He appeared back in Marvel Fanfare issue number 44 back in the day. He's, it's okay. I mean, it's not a major character, right? It's not a great big, huge thing. It's not a massive thing at all. But while Tony Stark is kind of exploring the area, waiting to be called forward by basically the guy who runs the show, that he ends up coming across an Ultimo. Now, the Ultimo was nuts. Now, Ultimo was a character who appeared in Tales of Suspense number 76 back in 1966. The Ultimo was not like the biggest deal ever when he first showed up, but as time progressed, and especially when characters like the Mandarin got his hands on him, he became a, a, became a hoss, right? Like the, the Ultimos are designed to be insanely durable. Now, the funny thing about this is that initially the Ultimo only had like maybe 30 appearances in Marvel Comics. So Christopher Cantwell is by all standards of measurement working with a blank slate here. He can kind of modify the history of the Ultimos as he sees fit, which is exactly what's going on here. We never really knew where the Ultimo came from. We never really knew where it originated from. We just knew that it was there one day and then it was being used by different villains and it was operating of its own accord. It could run at like 100 miles an hour. It stood at like 100 feet tall, right? These things were, were colossal in size. But where Tony Stark realizes that it is essentially a machine powered organism, he of course helps to power power his own suit, realizing that it's enzymatic along the way, right? There are enzymes blended with this technology, so it seems to be partly biological in nature. And so while he doesn't necessarily pick up immediately on the fact that it's an Ultimo, he realizes like this thing's got biological components. It's really more of a passing interest than anything else. When suddenly he's met by the arrival of Yar, who says like, the big guy will see you now. And so when, when Tony Stark gets there, he realizes it's Wilbur Day. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Stilt Man. So Stilt Man was created by Stan Lee and Wally Wood in Daredevil number eight back in 1965. He's never been a big time threat in Marvel Comics, right? I mean, he's literally, as you see him, that's what he does, right? Like he originally stole the technology from his employer, a guy named Carl Caxton, and then used it for his own ends. And he fought Daredevil a little bit, ended up in a bit of a, a criminal history there, but he was never significant, right? Wilbur Day was never one of those guys where it's like, oh my God, here comes Stilt Man. That was never going to happen, right? It's like, okay, here comes Stilt Man. Well, you know, he's, he's literally the guy that like, that like Daredevil's fighting when the story opens, right? Just to kind of show what Daredevil's doing at the time. That's basically how Stilt Man was and, and really always has been in Marvel comics. But the funny thing is, Stiltman hasn't been seen in Marvel for a long time. And that's one of the funny things here is that as the two of them are kind of talking, Iron Man's like, damn, man, like, like it's weird seeing you here. His knowledge of Wilbur Day is that he only ever got involved with people if he could achieve a, a, his own personal end, right? He's really just kind of a jerk. And so Iron Man's whole thing is like, okay, so like you're leading this whole thing. What do you get out of this, right? Like, I mean, what's, what's in it for you? He expects him to be this villain that he's familiar with. But one of the things that Iron Man quickly learns is that like, there's no room for that here, right? That everybody's just trying to live, right? They're just like, they've all just kind of been thrust here, teleported here in the same way that Iron Man has, right? That somewhere along the line, something happened and in the blink of an eye, they suddenly woke up here. Wilbur Day was one of the first, but the character of Yar, she was a, a, a she was a member of the Kree army, right? Like a, an, a Kree colonist and was just like teleported here, right? Everybody's just kind of been yanked here somewhere along the line. This is quite literally an island of misfit toys, right? That's basically what this is. Characters who were minor, small, irrelevant, never had any major role and, and there's no real logic or reason to why they're here in the first place. Honestly, I love that Cantwell's doing this. It's creative. It's really, really creative. I thought it was cool. Like this never, never would have occurred to me. And so the, the fact that everybody's just kind of been yanked here and they're just trying to live in this ecosystem, it's cool, right? Because it's basically really kind of showing the, you know, these people for what they are. If these people really do anything, it solidifies the views of Michael Korvac, right? That like, you can have a utopia, like you can have this kind of environment, but notice like it's a cast off. These people never would have lived in this environment had they not been forced into it, right? The circumstances led to them becoming where they are, or at least kind of living this life that they're living in, right? So there really is legitimacy to Korvac's argument here, right? It's really kind of interesting because even Iron Man finds himself letting his guard down. Of course, he explains why he can't take a suit off that if he does, it'll break his neck and he'll die. But like, he's just kind of enjoying his life, right? I mean, he's literally playing baseball with him, right? Just kind of enjoying this utopian lifestyle and just kind of chilling here to the point that he almost kind of doesn't want to leave. But then suddenly they're met by the arrival of one of the ultimate 
Ultimos who gets here. And that's when you kind of learn this little bit of a dark history here when it comes to the Ultimos is that they, one, originated from this planet and two, killed the people who created them, right? That this basically seems to be the place where they originated from and those individuals who, who created them were ultimately destroyed. And the way in which these Ultimos power themselves is by basically consuming enzymes, right? The reason why they're partly biological is one of them basically ends up grabbing Yar and then eats her, right? Like literally consumes her. And that's when Iron Man realizes, wow, like this is, this is basically how it is that they're biological. This story has an effect turned into Attack on Titan. <laughs> <laughs> right? Those giant robots roaming around eating people. I assume that's what it is. I don't never really watch Attack on Titan. Well, I take that back. Vinny over a comic story and tried to get me into anime by having me watch Attack on Titan. It was weird. People keep telling me I should watch it. I mean, I've seen like, like Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. It took me a little while to get into it, but you know, ultimately I got into it. Mariah got me into that just because of the fact that she watches it so often. I have basically watched the entire series of Avatar The Last Airbender, even though I guess it's not technically an anime, but I saw a bunch of those. So I guess I might as well sit down and watch, you know, attack on Titan, right? All these giant robots who are just eating people. I think it's weird, right? It's weird that giant robots are eating people, but hey, who am I to complain about, about anime being weird? But nonetheless, <laughs> it's, it's one of these funny things because with this Ultimo being destroyed, the reality is that in this environment in which they've lived, that the Ultimos are basically the predators, right? You know, it's like it's like living in the living out there in, in Africa and you have to contend with like lions and different things like that, right? Those apex predators that exist in that ecosystem. And then suddenly here comes Iron Man and takes out one of the Ultimos, right? It's like the, the the ages of primitive man when all they could do was run away from predators and then suddenly men develop spears, right? Humanity developed spears, we developed fire, things like that. Tools and resources that could be used that could elevate us from, from having been lower on the totem pole to being the apex predator on earth, right? It's, it's really what's being introduced here, a modification to the ecosystem. And so Iron Man isn't necessarily lauded as being like a leader and like taking over the role of controlling everything, but it's one of these things where it's just kind of like, okay, you know, it's like, he kind of looks around and he says like, so you say there's more of these things out there, but what you've built here is something beautiful, right? Like we shouldn't let those things destroy this, right? So what we should do is go in and take care of it, right? We should go handle these things, right? He's almost kind of like they're, they're sort of field commander, they're protector in a lot of ways because in reality, he's like, I like it here, right? I want to help you here. And again, the kind of note that's left on here by Christopher Cantwell is Iron Man doesn't really seem to want to leave. He kind of wants to stay. So with that being said, guys, that wraps up the books of, of Korvac volume two. I guess we'll now we'll have to wait for volume three to come out. I'm loving it, right? I'm loving what Cantwell's doing with Iron Man. I'm going to be honest, this is some of the most enjoyment I've had reading Iron Man's comics since uh, since really Kieran Gillen's run, right? The secret origin of Tony Stark and all that stuff, the introduction of Arno and everything. I'm really digging, like I'm really digging. I think it's some of the best Iron Man writing since then. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Iron Man. And the, the last videos that we did, it was kind of interesting about this. It is part of the books of Korvac, but this is more of like an interlude. So what we might do in order to keep things simple is we might take this, which is really the conclusion of this little bit of an interlude. We might wrap it into the other two episodes and make like a full story out of it. And then just throw it in the Iron Man playlist to kind of keep things simple. So it's not overly complicated or anything. But while the main books of Korvac isn't necessarily done, uh, this one has a great moment in this story. So much so that I kind of wanted to give it my full attention, which is why we're sort of doing it on its own, right? I don't really want to skim over anything here. But for those of you guys who are getting caught up here, the basis behind what's happening in Iron Man right now is that basically the villain Michael Korvac has returned. Now, a lot of people who are familiar with Marvel Comics know the name, so bear with me for a second for those who don't. But Michael Korvac is a very old villain in Marvel Comics. The Korvac saga is really one of the seminal stories, right? It's one of the most significant stories that Marvel Comics had ever done. But Michael Korvac was basically a guy who ended up attaining the power of godhood when he essentially stole the power of galactus and then ended up essentially fighting the guardian to the galaxy from the year 3000 uh and then of course he also faced off against the avengers right so it's a really really significant story just in terms of the marvel cosmic landscape right the marvel cosmic hierarchy but what had essentially happened is that at the beginning of this korvac had returned and then looking to reattain his level of godhood was traveling to the ship of galactus known as ta 2 for the purpose of stealing galactus's power yet again and so that's kind of where things are in the moment Tony Stark and really his ragtag teams like Misty Knight and Sam Wilson and you know Frogman and a few other people had basically been assembled in order to track down uh Michael Korvac and defeat him but Tony Stark was essentially thrown into this planet with a with a kind of disruption ray which was basically being led by longtime villain Stiltman and that was one of the funny things these are really obscure villains here and Christopher Cantwell's doing that across the board even Michael Korvac's henchmen are like B-list villains right like none of them are of any real significance the controller people like that 
it's not as though it's like Michael Korvac leading a team of like Thanos and all these guys. It's B-list villains, right? The kind of people you would expect to see somebody like Hawkeye face off against, right? Just nobody of any real significance here. And so what had happened is that prior to this, one of the occupants of this colony, a woman named Yar, had been killed by one of the Ultimo robots. And so of course, that's a, one of those giant robots that seems to originate from this world and just kind of travels around the landscape just eating things, right? So it's very reminiscent of like Attack on Titan, right? It's not that dissimilar, except in the show you have Titans and in this you basically have, you know, giant robots, which for the longest time, I always thought the Titans were giant robots. I'm still not convinced they're not. But the important thing here is that with Yar dying along with several other people, of course, they're basically holding a funeral and that's where Tony is struggling because he's talking with Colin, who is essentially the, the chief security officer for Stiltman, who's a combination of like the spiritual leader slash political leader, I guess, of this colony. And of course, you know, Colin kind of dealing with these, these you know, issues and, and so on, the death of people that they've basically grown close with over time, it hits them pretty hard. And that's when you have Iron Man who basically goes and have a, has a conversation with Stiltman. And the funny thing about this is that he asked him, he's like, why don't we just destroy these Ultimo robots, right? Like if these robots are here, I've already destroyed one, we can destroy all the others. But the the, the explanation offered by, uh, by Stiltman is that these things seem to originate from just some singularity out there somewhere, right? Like some machine creating other machines. But we don't know if they're coming in from like a different, different dimension. We have no idea how all this stuff works. All we know is that they just seem to appear and they basically travel around the landscape and then basically kill and consume whatever it is that they happen to come across. And so at the end of the day, like, yes, I love your, your desire to help here, but what we're better off doing here is focusing our efforts on creating what is in essence a signal beacon, right? Something that can basically send out an SOS into the universe and someone can come and rescue us, right? Because for right now, Tony Stark's kind of stranded here. And in the midst of this conversation he has with Stiltman, suddenly he's met by Patsy Walker. Now remember, Patsy Walker is a member of Tony Stark's team. And that while the, the crew is still on that ship, Tony Stark was basically yanked away. And that's why he's here. And so as a result of this, Patsy Walker is basically communicating to him through like the ship's technology. And where you would ask, well, why don't they just come here and pick up Tony Stark? The explanation is given to us, and it's actually a pretty solid explanation that's given here, that where Tony Stark doesn't necessarily ask like, why don't you come and pick me up? The explanation given by Patsy Walker is the mission is more important than you, right? Michael Korvac represents a clear and present danger to the universe. If he gets to Galactus's world ship before we do, and we have no discernible means of stopping him, right? Like basically he overpowers us and presumably even kills us. He'll steal the power of Galactus and things will be right back where they were before, right? Where he recreates existence. That was the significance of the original Korvac saga. Michael Korvac was so powerful, the only way to defeat him was for him to end his own life. Like literally he destroyed himself in order to set everything back to the way it was supposed to be. In reality, Marvel kind of wrote themselves into a hole, but that's how powerful he was. And that's the level of power that we're looking at again, right? A person who really seemed to go insane with the power of Galactus being able to recreate reality as they see fit. And so what you have here is Patsy Walker communicating with Tony and saying, one, I know you've turned off your morphine regulator because remember, Tony Stark's neck is broken. That's why he's staying in his Iron Man suit is because if he takes the suit off, like if he takes off his helmet, that's the end of him, right? I mean, he said like literally his, his neck is hanging on by a threat, right? His spine, if it moves in a millimeter in the wrong direction, either he'll die or he'll be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of his life. And so keeping his head stationary by keeping the helmet on, that's the only thing that's keeping him from experiencing that fate. And so because of that, he's just kind of keeping himself doped up on morphine all the time, which really throws in this idea that Tony Stark's not necessarily thinking clearly or rationally. And when he tells Patsy Walker, when she says like, no, 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 we're going to go deal with Korvac, the response to Tony is, no, you can't do that, right? If you do that, you guys are going to get killed and your deaths are going to be on my conscience. But Patsy Walker makes a really good point here. She's like, no, you can't take that approach, right? Like this is a choice that we're making. And if you say, if we go and fight Korvac, we are going to die and it's something you're going to have to live with, then it takes away from the choice that we made, right? It basically says like, we are like, like mirrors of you. We're reflections of you, right? We, we do what you would do. We're not really capable of making our own intelligent, rational decisions, but we know what we're doing. We know that we're going to go after Michael Korvac. We know he may very well kill us and we accept that fact, right? It's our role as heroes to put the safety of individuals or universes or the planet or what have you ahead of our own lives to be willing to make that sacrifice. And so following that, Tony Stark becomes kind of suspicious of everything Stiltman was saying and, and offering this explanation that like these machines are coming from some singularity out there, the fact that they don't really know a whole lot about them and so on and so forth. And so what he does is of course he sneaks off to one of the machines and when he gets to the Ultimo robot, he's immediately attacked by Colin. And the reason why is because as the head of security, Colin wasn't really given the details. He was just told by, uh, by Stiltman, make sure nobody gets close 
close to these things. Now, the explanation I imagine was probably offered if one was even offered at all, like assuming one actually happened is, well, if you mess with it, it could send out a beacon to the other Ultimo robots and they would all descend on us, right? Like you would bring death and destruction down on us. More so than that, the citizens of this colony trust Stiltman implicitly. They don't really have a reason to question him. And so because of that, they just sort of go with whatever it is that he says. But Tony Stark knows enough about Wilbur to know he was a villain. And so while he may be telling the truth, Tony Stark's approaching this from the perspective of trust, but verify. And so when he shows up here and he's immediately attacked by Colin, that tips them off that either Colin's working with him or Colin doesn't know what's going on. And so where Tony Stark gets the upper hand on Colin is like, what are you hiding here? What's going on? That's when Colin spills the beans. Like, look, I'm just doing what I was told. I was told to make sure that nobody got close to this thing. I don't even know why, right? All I know is Wilbur said something about like the, the balance is fragile or something along those lines. And so as Tony Stark starts going through this Ultima robot and investigating it, what he finds is that it's actually being controlled remotely, right? There's like an, an IR circuit, right? An infrared circuit. This thing's being controlled. And so that's when he realizes Stiltman is the one that's doing this. Now, here's the great thing about this. And this is what I loved about the way that Christopher Cantwell handled this. This is one of those moments when anybody could have just been like, well, Stiltman did it because he's a villain. And Stiltman's like, absolute power, you know, like that kind of a thing. Instead, it's this great philosophical argument. And you guys know I love these kinds of, these kinds of positions, these kinds of discussions. It's this, right? That when Tony Stark runs up on Stiltman and is like, you're the one controlling these Ultimo robots. You're the one bringing them here. You're the one that's causing problems here. You know, literally the one that's getting people killed. The response of Stiltman is essentially a small price to pay in order to maintain the balance. This is game theory. In fact, if we want to go with an example that's probably more familiar to you, let's look at Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, right? I don't know if you guys ever played that game, but when you're looking for the star map on Kashyyyk, you're kind of given these different game theory type scenarios, right? The prisoner's dilemma, different things like that. One of the questions is this. It says, imagine you are the leader of a nation. Consider enemy states to be weak and remote. With no external threat, your empire stagnates. Your people become complacent and then they begin to question you. However, in your investigation of this attack, you discover a weakness that would come after the attack. And that weakness would actually allow you to destroy the enemy once and for all. What do you do? And the answer to that scenario is you allow the attack to happen because the people would rally under you against a common foe. And that's really what Stiltman's talking about here. Now, the reality is Stiltman's also engineering these attacks, but what it does is it unifies the community and saying those Ultimos are a threat. So long as we focus on trying to find a way to get out of here, then everything will be okay. Now, of course, the idea of sending out some kind of an SOS beacon, that sort of a feeling of comfort and safety, the hope that comes with that would only last for so long. But that's why you would have to generate a new thing for them to rally around. And then a new thing after that, and a new thing after that, that where Stiltman considers them to be part of this ecosystem, essentially, he also had his own personal ambitions, which was to prove that he could be a leader, to prove the idea that having individuals who live these lives where there is no real external threat out there, and that in the absence of any kind of external threats, that people would live up to their fullest potential, that that's actually not true. That if people are given the opportunity to do whatever it is that they want to do with their lives and to live their lives however they see fit, that they would ultimately grow to become stagnant, that they would either do everything there was to do or they would do nothing. But the idea of having this sort of external threat out there that's always looming on the horizon, that while it does cause a bit of stress and anxiety among the people, it also unifies them because if they're focusing on an enemy, they're not focusing on each other. And once that enemy goes away, then that's when differences start to crop up. That's when you don't believe what I believe or you don't think what I think, right? You don't feel the same way that I feel about these things. Therefore, you are the bad guy. That's how you end up with strife and civil war. So it's actually a very smart maneuver on his behalf to be willing to sacrifice some innocent lives in order to maintain the cohesiveness of the overall community. I mean, is that philosophy a little bit ruthless? Sure, but it cannot be argued that the philosophy works. And so it's a pretty interesting concept. Now, of course, Iron Man and those guys basically end up overcoming Stiltman, right? They manage to defeat him and that's basically it. But in the midst of him pleading his case to them and telling them what's going on, that he essentially engineered a circumstance whereby innocent people would be killed in order to satisfy the, the livelihood of the greater whole, that all these individuals who have overheard it kind of descend back into their own selfish motivations where the response is, how dare you sacrifice innocent lives to maintain this entire community and to keep it from falling into a state of civil war, right? What's your problem? <laughs> and so all these guys basically descend on Stiltman, carry him away, presumably to, to kill him or destroy him or whatever the case happens to be. But the crazy thing about this is that as Colin and Iron Man are basically leaving, suddenly 
Tony Stark's met by the most unexpected person, which is the Living Tribunal. And the Living Tribunal literally just appears here and says, Tony Stark, right? And Tony's just kind of shocked, like, holy cow, the Living Tribunal just appeared to me, right? But the Tribunal says the universe is on the verge of catastrophic imbalance. Only you can restore this balance. You must travel to the world ship of Galactus at this very moment. Now, here's the reality of this. And this is one of the shortcomings of Christopher Cantwell, and not even just him, the shortcoming of Marvel Comics in relation to how they use the Living Tribunal, where Iron Man replies and says, so from what you're telling me, my friends will not be able to stop Korvac on their own. I have to do it. The response of the Tribunal is, you gravely misunderstand my words, but you still must leave right now. And Tony Stark says, okay, fine, I'll do it, but you need to return all these people back to their home, which of course the Living Tribunal does, and then teleports Iron Man and Avro back to the, uh, or over to the world ship of Tatu, the world ship of Galactus. Here's the problem with how Marvel handles the Living Tribunal. Back in the day when the Tribunal was a major player in Marvel Comics, and I'm not even talking about like his first appearance as Doctor Strange, even then he wasn't even fully fleshed out. He's like, I represent God or something like that. And like, I do some stuff. Like the reality is that as time progressed, Marvel fleshed his character out more and gave him an actual role to exist in, which is to maintain balance of the universe. And that normally whenever there was any kind of imbalance, the tribunal would either be requested by the various cosmic entities, like what you saw during Infinity Gauntlet when they asked him to rule against Thanos. And the response of the tribunal was, no, Thanos attaining the Infinity Stones and then assembling the gauntlet, that's just a natural part of the universe. They exist in this universe. He's not abusing his power. Furthermore, if the goal of Thanos is to take over, to basically destroy Eternity and replace him, that's the natural order of things, right? The weak make way for the strong. It'd be different if he had kind of gotten some energy source from outside the universe and then brought it into the universe, then that creates an imbalance. But using the tools the universe provides in order to expand his own power, that's just the way it goes. But either it would be a situation like that, or it would be something like from the, the protege storyline where protege had this level of power where he could duplicate the powers of anybody and that it would be different if he was born that way. But the reality is he was engineered to be that way. And so because of that, it violated the natural order of things, creating these kind of standards by which the, the tribunal lives and the tribunal steps in. It's weird to see the tribunal show up and say, yes, Tony Stark, I am the walking, talking embodiment of the multiverse and I can wipe out whole universes with a wave of my hand, but only you can stop Michael Korvac, right? I mean, it's, it's it's like the rain telling humanity only you can stop forest fires, right? It doesn't make any sense, right? Why don't you do that, rain? It's kind of what you do. But that's kind of the way the character has been portrayed over the years. If I'm being honest with you guys, the most recent and faithful depiction of the tribunal came during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. And it's not because I'm just a huge fan of that story, but it's because the beyonders in the multiverse killing cosmic entities, it's like some kind of a, a virus in the human body. It's a foreign threat. And so the Living Tribunal stepping in and trying to destroy the Beyonders, it makes the most practical sense. It's what it's supposed to do. And so the result of this is that the Tribunal just kind of been misused over the years. He's really sort of been turned into a plot device more so than anything else. So while it is cool to see the Tribunal here, the significance of the Tribunal being here has kind of been lost on comic book readers over the years because it's almost like the Tribunal kind of plays the role of a watcher now, right? Where when the Tribunal pops up, it means he's not going to do anything, but you know something big's about to happen, right? And that's, that's really kind of how those things go. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are back with Iron Man from Christopher Cantwell. And initially, I was going to record this alongside uh, the issue that comes out on Wednesday, which is basically the conclusion of the books of Korvac 3, kind of the conclusion of this, this bit of an era. But so much happens here, I kind of wanted to give it its own video, right? And then we'll do a follow-up video on Wednesday with the third part. So I guess tomorrow, at the time we're recording this video, maybe Thursday, I'm not really sure. The important thing here is that basically you now have Iron Man, uh, who's a essentially here on the, the world ship of Galactus. Now, again, he's also accompanied by Colin. Remember, Colin is one of the people who was on board the, the kind of plan, that kind of community that Iron Man was on in that little two or three issue story arc that we covered. Nothing super significant here, uh, but he's here to kind of accompany him, right? The Living Tribunal basically appeared to Iron Man and was like, hey man, uh, so like you gotta go. You gotta get to this world ship, otherwise things are gonna pop off. <laughs> so him and, uh, and Colin were teleported here. Now, the big question that a lot of people have been asking, and I've seen this in the comments, a lot of you guys have been asking, what's going on with Galactus at this point in time? Okay, so we haven't really seen 
seen, at least it's not as far as I'm aware, we haven't seen anything resolved with Galactus following the events of Donny Cates' first story arc of Thor. So as far as we're aware, Galactus is still gone, right? He's still basically out of the picture, which is one of the reasons why his world ship was so readily accessible. Right? It's one of the things to remember, very rarely do you ever see Galactus when he's not on his world ship. That his world ship serves as much a measure of protection as it does a transportation device or something like that. It's basically his home. The whole thing about this is Galactus, with him being out of the picture, it makes it easier for people to arrive here. Now, whether or not Christopher Cantwell ties directly into the aftermath of Thor is something that we're not really told here. Instead, it's really just kind of like the ship is largely empty. But just because Galactus is not here does not mean it's a, it's a walk in the park, right? Remember, Galactus has all kinds of safety measures along Ta too. And the first of these come in the form of like drones and little sort of basic security measures that both Iron Man and Colin are caught in. Now, Colin is hit by one of these, one of these, you know, lasers, and it's not enough to kill him, right? But it's enough to do a little bit of damage to him. I mean, really, he has his armor, so that's what protects him. If it were just him, flesh and blood, oh, he would have been incinerated. But of course, Iron Man and Colin working together are able to make their way past all these different traps and whatnot until they come across the Punisher robots. Now, the Punisher robots, I think, are something that we've never really talked about here on the YouTube channel, and largely because we never really had a reason to. The Punisher robots are only ever really an option, or you only ever really see them in Marvel Comics when you're dealing with the world ship of Galactus, but they've been around for a long, long time. They go all the way back to Fantastic Four issue number 49, right? Like the original Galactus trilogy, right? They're just one of the security measures here. Now, the funny thing about this is we don't really know much about them. All we really know is that they are a form of technology that Galactus had acquired somewhere along the line in the history of the universe. But by and large, whatever form of technology they came from is largely believed to have been extinct. And that kind of makes sense, right? When it comes to like alien races and things like that in, in Marvel Comics, multiple races, regardless of their technological advancements, have largely just come into existence and then died out over the course of the billions of years that the universe has been around. So this is just one of those little things that Galactus acquired over the course of his time. Now, they also also have the ability to duplicate their metallic composition is something we're not fully aware of, but they're pretty capable. They're more than enough to go toe to toe with people like Iron Man and so on and so forth. But of course, Tony Stark in a position where it's like, we've got much bigger fish to fry. It's one of these things where Christopher Cantwell doesn't really make them like a throwaway thing. He really presents them as a credible threat to Iron Man. It's simply just, we're in a rush. We got stuff to do. So these things are basically taken apart pretty quickly and then they basically bail out. Now, of course, as one of these things is being destroyed, it initiates a self-destruct countdown and then just explodes. Loads, right? I mean, one of the things to keep in mind when it comes to Galactus's world ship, it's massive, right? It's bigger than planets. So they're only in one little facet of it. I mean, this thing goes on for quite some time. It's, if you ever get a chance, and maybe we'll do a video on it, I guess I don't really know how we would do a video on the world ship of Galactus, but it is colossal in size, right? It's just, it's ridiculous how big it is. But of course, once these threats are basically dealt with, Iron Man and Colin kind of make their way through the, uh, through the, the ship itself until they basically realize that there's another ship inbound. Now, Initially, Iron Man, of course, hopes it's his friend, right? Patsy Walker and Jim uh, James Rhodes, you know, Iron Man, or, or at least uh, War Machine at this point in time, and a few other people. Uh, in reality, it's the forces of Michael Korvac. Now, remember, of course, Michael Korvac is trying to access the world ship of Galactus the same way he did previously and turn himself into God, right? That's really what's, what's going on here with this intention. The crazy thing is that, of course, a fight breaks out between Iron Man and Colin, as well as the forces of Michael Korvac, and, uh, and Colin is destroyed destroyed quite readily. Like he's literally just obliterated. I mean, just, just totally annihilated by, by Korvac, which of course pisses off uh, Iron Man. Iron Man attacks and actually rips the arm off of Michael Korvac, because remember, he's basically a robot at this point in time. And then in turn, he, you know, Iron Man, of course, is basically overpowered by the forces of Korvac. And so following that, you basically end up having like Patsy Walker and you've got James Rhodes, War Machine, all those guys who essentially show up on the scene just in time to save Iron Man from being destroyed. Now, one of the other things to kind of go on here is that the forces of Korvac could have killed Iron Man, but in his arrogance, Michael Korvac wanted Iron Man to bear witness to him basically becoming God. One, to experience the complete depths of his failure in trying to stop Korvac, and two, to witness what Korvac will do in terms of recreating the universe, recreating all of existence. And so there is a bit of a conflict that kind of unfolds in terms of these little pot shots and stopgap measures of the forces of Iron Man to try to prevent uh, Michael Korvac and his guys from getting to the actual energy source of uh, of Galactus' ship and basically absorbing that power. It's not overly important here, just kind of like a few things here and there, a few little skirmishes. The real big takeaway from this is essentially once they reach Korvac, because he is basically just a robot, despite how 
capable he is, they were able to tear him apart. Now, one thing that did happen here is that during his time making his way to the world ship of Galactus, Korvac did come across Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch, right? The Human Torch before you ever had Johnny Storm. Uh, of course, Jim Hammond is an actual cyborg, but using a kind of controller disc that was created by the controller, it allowed Korvac to bring Jim Hammond under his control. Once that disc was removed by Patsy Walker, once she realized it was there, then basically Jim Hammond turned coded against Korvac, and then it's really the only reason why they're actually able to overcome Korvac in the first place. I mean, you have like Misty Knight who's shooting at them and so on, and then Patsy Walker's just sitting there watching it all unfold, because what's she gonna do? And so you basically have like Jim Hammond and you have Iron Man <laughs> that are blasting Korvac with all the energy they have, which is enough to seemingly destroy a good chunk of his physical form, right? It annihilates basically the skin off of his body, and then all that's left is his robotic form, which Iron Man, of course, punches through the chest with the intention of destroying him. The funny thing about this is that Korvac basically plays possum here, that while Iron Man's kind of like, okay, cool, we destroyed Korvac, the day is saved, and everybody's kind of out there just sort of like relaxing, and they're like, okay, we gotta find a way to basically, you know, get off this thing, right, dispose of the body, that kind of stuff, so we don't have to worry about him coming back. Then suddenly Korvac just jumps up and lunges directly for the, the energy source of Galactus, essentially giving himself the power cosmic. And in Iron Man's act of desperation, he does the same thing, that he basically puts himself in there. Now, this is one of the biggest developments to come out of this, this story by Christopher Cantwell, the nature of the power cosmic. When it comes to the power cosmic in Marvel Comics, it's, it's largely been ambiguous, right? Marvel's always just kind of said, it's the source of Galactus' power, done, right? And that's basically, and that's, that's really all you get. One of the things that's kind of given here sort of sort of put here is iron man kind of having his own recording device right for his suit says like record everything that i'm saying here and everything that i'm seeing he says the power cosmic from what i understand scientifically it's the primary substance of omniscience omnipresence the collapse of space and time into a singular energy matter manipulation the removal of boundaries between dimensions anything and everything essentially what what looks like christopher cantwell is saying here is that the power cosmic cosmic itself is basically godhood the ability to do anything you want to do the ability to like leave universes right to travel from one universe to the next to control anything and everything in all of existence now in reality we would have i mean if this is if this is a, a new definition for the power cosmic the question we have to ask is why didn't galactus just use it to its full potential, right? Why doesn't Galactus travel to alternate realities, travel to other universes, right? Some dead universe or something like that. You know, why Why is it that the power of godhood is seemingly being used in a limited capacity by Galactus? And we ha we kind of have to extrapolate an answer, right? To sort of delve into the realm of, of hearsay and haphazard guessing. I would argue that this is because it's the role Galactus plays. The Galactus is a cosmic entity that people like Eternity and people like Infinity and Master Order and Lord K chaos and people like that, oblivion and so on, they're capable of incredible feats, but you never really see them exercising those things. The reason why is because it's not their job to. And Galactus's job is to basically travel around the cosmos and consume life-sustaining planets in order to basically propagate his existence. In years past, Marvel's tried to sort of explain this with stories like the Abraxas saga and saying that if Galactus were to die, he would unleash what is in effect the representation of chaos and destruction across the multiverse, which came in the form of Abraxas wasn't a story that people took to very well, so Marvel kind of swept it under the rug once they ended it, and that was it. You just never saw or heard from Abraxas again. They've had stories like the trial of Reed Richards, where they've basically explained the role Galactus plays across the universe, but then people also kind of find themselves asking the question, if this really is basically the source of godhood, then why doesn't Galactus just like fill up on some source of energy and then create a world that basically is that he could essentially deposit all that energy into and then take all that energy out and just kind of live in a sort of repeating pattern of like, consuming the energy of that world and then giving that energy back to himself. So his power stays stagnant across the board, never increases, never decreases, but he doesn't have to destroy planets across the entirety of the cosmos. If we were to invoke the Celestials origin, which is really what Marvel's doing now, right? They're taking the origin of the Celestials from Earth X and they're rolling it directly into uh, the main Marvel universe. It initially started with Jonathan Hickman in S.H.I.E.L.D. and now has become kind of a mainstay in Kieran Gillen's Eternals. The Galactus's true purpose is to travel around the universe and basically destroy 
worlds that, that Celestials would normally deposit their quote-unquote offspring into in order to prevent Celestials from overpopulating the universe. That's the role he plays now. But that's why you don't see him using this, this level of power to its full totality, because he's simply just not supposed to. And so once Iron Man basically experiences what it means to effectively be imbued with the power cosmic, reliving his own past, going through all these different moments, confronting his failures as a person, and seeing himself as he truly is. Once the process is effectively complete, he's officially bonded with the power cosmic, he goes forward not in the same capacity that Michael Korvac does, which is to bend the universe to his whim, to do whatever it is that he wants with all of existence, but instead to turn the universe into a place where seemingly he can actually improve it, right? It's one of the things that Iron Man says, right? He's like, he's like, this is my time. I have so many ideas. I could fix everything, starting with myself, but that's just the beginning. I promise you it would all be so beautiful. This leads to him going back and confronting Michael Korvac, basically appearing as Iron Man being God, right? Cosmic Iron Man, right? The Iron God, if you want to call him that, whatever the case is. I mean, the guy has so many names. And so once this fight and this whole conflict breaks out, what we actually end up doing is transitioning over to what is in effect a priest, basically him living on the planet Satania, which really looks more like a space station than a tried and true planet. But whatever you want to call it, right? Just kind of these, these, this, this giant space station sitting on a, on a piece of a dead world that basically this guy kind of chronicles everything going on, right? He talks about like Draconius. He talks about the cosmic entities and all that kind of stuff. And in effect, we kind of jump back, right? To this point when Michael Korvac and Iron Man were basically fighting each other, that this guy living on this world had basically lived on a very peaceful world, right? But they were also capable of shape-shifting different things like that. This idea that they basically just kind of wanted to be left alone. And they were never really much of a threat to anybody unless somebody made themselves a threat, right? Otherwise they were largely pacifist, but that their entire world essentially ended when the fight between Michael Korvac and Iron Man ended up destroying a star, right? Setting a star to supernova. And that these people had minutes to evacuate in the aftermath of this star exploding because as fast as light travels in the midst of an explosion in space, it was only a matter of time before it annihilated their world. And so what you have here, and this is what's kind of interesting, what you have here is a battle of cosmic proportions between Iron Man as God wielding this power cosmic and Michael Korvac doing the same thing. Now, here's the funny thing to understand about this. The way a battle like this would actually happen, it probably wouldn't really be fought in this way, right? It would likely be fought by a way of something like the astral plane or something along those lines. But Marvel depicts the fight of cosmic entities by having like worlds destroyed, basically like a street fight as if the street fight took place and the battleground was the was the entire universe in order to illustrate the gravity of the power these guys have. And, and one of the funny things about this, this all started with Jim Starlin, that it wasn't always done this way. But when Jim Starlin wrote Infinity Gauntlet and the only real way to depict the massive scale of the battle that was taking place was for like celestials to throw planets at Thanos in an effort to defeat him when he had the Infinity Gauntlet, it became a mainstay of Marvel Comics. And that's the reason why, and, and while you did kind of see that beforehand a little bit, that's the reason why post-Infinity Gauntlet, when you see a massive battle like this between two godly beings, that planets are just caught in the crossfire. Stars, different things like that. It's designed to illustrate how massive this is, right? I mean, there's literally a point when Iron Man gets the upper hand on Michael Korvac, and Michael Korvac takes a moment to rest by sitting on a planet, right? Or by just, by kind of like laying on an entire planet. It's just, it's, it's designed to illustrate the gravity of it all. It's really the best you can do in the world of comics. And it's one of those funny things because the battle between them is as much philosophical as it is literal, right? In the sense that Iron Man's like, you have a small perspective, Michael Korvac. Your goal is to basically conquer the universe and then turn it into how you believe the universe should function. I have bigger ideas. I've got grander plans. There's much better things that we can do. And so what's kind of interesting here is that when that star is destroyed and ultimately ends up wiping out the planet of, of, of Draconius, that Iron Man actually comments on it. It was like, do you even feel what it was that you just did? You annihilated a star, which wiped out basically the entire solar system, right? And, and the response of Korvac is a necessary sacrifice to stop your interference. And that's kind of the funny thing, because it is, right? I mean, if, you know, most people, I imagine, would look at this from the perspective of, oh my God, he just destroyed that entire star and now those people are dead, right? But when you're wielding the power cosmic, you can, you can basically reconstitute the star and resurrect those people from the dead. So are they really dead in the first place, right? It's one of those kind of moral philosophical quandaries. If you have the ability to resurrect a dead person back to life in their original state before they were ever killed, was it morally wrong to kill them in the first place? I mean, it's, it's one of those weird little quagmires that you kind of find yourself dealing with whenever you're looking at stories and comics. One of the many reasons why I love comics so much. But the, the whole idea of 
Iron Man is I don't intend to wipe out entire civilizations in order to make the universe better. We don't really know what his motivation is or at least how his plan would unfold. We simply just know that he doesn't really want to destroy things or, or even just like recreate all existence in the same capacity Michael Korvac does. And so realizing that this fight within this universe would lead to just massive calamities and all levels of destruction, this basically leads to Iron Man creating a portal to another reality, to another universe, and sending Michael Korvac through. The funny thing is that once he sends him into this universe, we don't really get an explanation of what universe this is. We're just told it's a dead universe, where seemingly everything in this universe was destroyed. We don't know how it happened. We don't really even know why it happened. We simply just know that it did. This is not the Cancerverse, right? If this were the Cancerverse, it would be filled to the brim with life, right? I mean, it would just, it, it would just be ships everywhere and all kinds of stuff. The many angled ones would probably immediately seize on uh, on Michael Korvac in Iron Man and just subjugate them. And in truth, despite the power cosmic that they have, they really wouldn't be able to stand much of a chance against those guys. I mean, Galactus in that universe had the power cosmic and he was destroyed. They literally turned him into the Galactus engine. For those of you guys who don't know what I'm talking about, Thanos Imperative was a ridiculously great story where like they turned Galactus into a machine, like into, a, in just, in, into what's basically just a giant cosmic gun. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely nuts. But with this guy, you know, but of course him kind of telling this, this story in, in the past tense, with him basically observing, right? This piece observing this fight between Michael Korvac and, uh, and, and Iron Man, the fight is just colossal in scale, right? Huge amounts of energy being let off. And then in a moment when Michael Korvac is just kind of temporarily knocked out or, or however you want to see it, when it's a bit of a reprieve, Iron Man realizes they're in a section or they're in the, the Sol system, right? Like the Milky Way galaxy, and he sees Earth. That Earth looks like it was basically just destroyed, right? I mean, it's, it's not really destroyed in the physical sense, just like devoid of life. And he realizes that like, that's a fate that could potentially befall the world because of humanity's own actions or an alien invasion or something like that. And he's like, I will help my universe, right? I will help my universe become better than it has been. And so when Michael Korvac goes on the attack, the response of Iron Man is, I'm sorry, Korvac, it's my turn now. And just bam, just like attacks this guy. And he doesn't necessarily destroy him, or at least it may seem like he kind of destroys him. But what it does is it basically meets with the arrival of the cosmic entities now here's the thing right it's the cosmic entities sure like eternity and in death and like you know sire hate and mistress love and like the in-betweener and infinity and all that kind of stuff the big thing here is oblivion and the living tribunal show up here and it's kind of like like literally the tribunal is like this battle ceases now right this battle ends now right this is this is done right this whole thing is finished like you have disturbed the natural balance of things michael korback you have seized a power that does not not belong to you and elevated yourself to godhood you will come with us now here's a funny thing about this is that could the tribunal particularly have involved himself at any point in time Sure, right? The power of the living tribunal trumps the power of, of the, the power cosmic, or at least it seemed to be that way, right? Maybe that's not the case anymore, right? It looks like Christopher Cantwell's kind of toying with the, the cosmic hierarchy in Marvel Comics, right? That a wielder of the power cosmic is basically a person who wields the power to do anything and everything with no limit to the things they can or cannot do, right? When you're dealing with cosmic entities, sure, they can do a whole lot of stuff, but eternity's power is limited to the universe that he represents. He can't alter a different universe because he's the physical manifestation of the universe. It's like the color red being able to change the color blue. Unless you mix the two together, it's not going to happen. They're just two distinctly different colors. But the important thing is that uh, is that the cosmic entities basically step in and are like, we're done, right? They ultimately end up taking uh, Michael Korvac away. Now, the question that's asked here really comes by way of master order when he says like, what do we do with Iron Man, right? This guy has been imbued with the power of the cosmos itself. Like he can open portals to other other realities the guy can basically do anything he wants to now of course mistress love says give him trust sire hate says give him pain and then of course mistress death is just like kill him, right you know because she's obsessed with death and even oblivion steps in now the funny thing about this is that it appears that the statement of oblivion trumps the statement of everybody else oblivion says it matters not what we give or do not give the path has been set, so says Oblivion. And so at that point, the tribunal basically steps in and says, presently, your future is clouded, right? But the ultimate outcome may be satisfactory to us. And so ultimately, the cosmic entities take Michael Kor back away, and Iron Man himself basically returns to the main Marvel Universe. And so in the end, what you end up getting is this priest, of course, again, who crash lands on Satania after escaping this dead reality and, and witnessing this meeting of the cosmic entities and so on, and just kind of re recording everything that's happened here basically kills himself.
What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Iron Man from Christopher Cantwell and we are covering this point where basically Iron Man has essentially become God, right? Where he's basically got the powers of Galactus and seemingly the power cosmic in its totality. And the result of this is of course a little bit of time has passed in the sense that you have like War Machine, right? You got James Rhodes, you got the original Human Torch, Patsy Walker and all those folks back on Earth and they're kind of having a conversation. So one of the things that is easy to, I wouldn't say misinterpret, but easy to forget when it comes to the various cosmic beings that exist out there in Marvel Comics is the nature of time. That time is relative to cosmic abstracts. And in fact, with the exception of people like Galactus and Infinity, because she represents the nature of it, time doesn't really matter to the cosmic entities. The cosmic entities appearing in the year 1900 is really no different than them appearing in the year 2000, right? Because for them, things just simply exist, right? I mean, there is a point whereby the universe will begin and the universe will end, but Marvel never really gives us this idea that cosmic entities really care about the concept of time. And for someone like Tony Stark, right, when he had undergone the process of experiencing what it meant to undertake the power cosmic, to have that power given to him and then go through the whole process of being imbued with it that time had passed but we were never really given how much time had passed because that's designed to kind of mirror how the cosmic entities see existence right just a seemingly series of successive moments but no real differentiation between how much time passes between each individual moment it's just a series of things that take place it kind of makes sense not a super important thing but it's good to see that Christopher Cantwell sort of notices this but of course at that point Tony Stark does arrive on earth and when he shows up here it's very reminiscent to how you would expect Galactus to appear or a character that imposing. Now, it's also kind of feeding into the ego of Tony Stark a little bit. And in fact, what he does with this power is kind of funny here in a little while because he shrinks down to a more reasonable size, right? That people can kind of comprehend and they don't necessarily find so intimidating. And then in the midst of all that, as he's talking to James Rose, there's not really much of a conversation here, right? Like he's literally there for like two seconds. The Avengers show up alongside the Fantastic Four. And the funny thing here is that they don't quite know what to make of Tony Stark. And the reason why is because while Tony has done some things, a lot of them are also familiar with the things that Tony has done, right? So say for example, the idea of the Infinity Gauntlet. One of the things a lot of you guys may not know is Iron Man's had the Infinity Gauntlet. And in fact, Iron Man got the Infinity Gauntlet off of Parker Robbins, the Hood, when the Hood got the Infinity Gauntlet. Now, of course, the other members of the Illuminati knew what was going on because Tony Stark taking it and then telling everybody else who was there, uh, these gems need to be taken care of, it's too dangerous, all that kind of stuff was really him taking it and then the Illuminati splitting the gems among themselves. But the important thing is they know how shady Tony Stark can be. And when you take like the shadiness of Tony Stark and then you combine it with basically godly power, who knows what he's going to do? And that's one of those things where like they start to question like, what are your motivations here, right? Is Michael Korvac still a threat? Of course, at the end of the day, he's like, you know, Michael Korvac is basically defeated. But when Captain America asked the question, well, what about you? Are you a threat? His response is, well, that sounds awfully loaded. And Steve's like, I'm very concerned. And so in the end, his response is, well, I mean, can you relax, right? We've all dealt with gods before. Look at Thor, right? It's the exact same five. And Thor's like, no, we're not. I'm, I'm totally different here. <laughs> this is a whole different thing. And so the big question people have is, what's Tony Stark going to do with this power? And so what he does is he makes this amazing speech, right? This amazing impassioned thing. And he says, okay, well, Korvac was right in wanting harmony, but wrong about how to get there. He believed that he alone knew best. He put himself and his opinions above others. And then he asks him, he asks the Avengers, he's like, doesn't that sound familiar to you guys? And he says, Korvac was wrong to hoard his intellect, wrong to want to take away free will from everyone else. I had the Infinity Gems once, but I wasn't going to force anything with them, and I won't now either. But then, how does one make something harmonious while preserving the individual? And he says, well, I looked at my own gifts. I'm talking about the things I had before these new powers. I thought of solutions and ideas I've had in the past and how they've gone awry and I realized something. They didn't work because they were trapped in here in my head. But now what's in here doesn't have to be trapped inside anymore. It can be shared as a gift. Now, the funny thing about this is that there's a kind of irrit irritable moment that takes place, right? And this is the thing that kind of gives people pause for concern is that Captain America keeps interrupting Iron Man and saying, wait, like, hold on, man. Like, here's the thing. And as Iron Man is trying to make his point, Captain America keeps interrupting him, trying to, trying to literally make his case. And the response of Iron Man is, let me finish, right? And just kind of like grows to this huge size. Now understand, this is not Iron Man getting carried away with his power. 
power. This is Iron Man being pissed with Captain America, because the point that Iron Man was making up until this moment is that there's a kind of hubris that comes with the Avengers. Yes, they're as much street-level heroes as they are the Earth's mightiest heroes, saving Earth from various threats and saving some guy, random guy on the street, who's being mugged by somebody else. But there's a hubris in the Avengers in the sense that because they're superheroes, and because they've saved the Earth from so many threats and they do good things, they know what's best. And so Captain America, in the eyes of Iron Man, embodies that hubris more than anything else. I'm Captain America. I've been around for a long, long time. I have great battle strategy, and I know how to organize and galvanize the superhero community. Everyone should listen to me, right? That kind of irritation. Now, of course, a lot of it's also just because these guys have just had a sketchy history ever since the events of Civil War. But what Iron Man says here is my gift is now in all of you. My intellect, my level of aptitude, it's yours. You are all now Stark level geniuses. But it's kind of a funny thing because the whole question here is, well, what if we don't want it? And he's like, well, I mean, it's too late, right? It's done. You're all now as brilliant as I am. And so is every living person in the city. And he says, I figured we'd start with a small sample size and see how it goes. And he says, I don't want things to get too far ahead, right? I don't want this experiment to be something that I effectively lose control of. And the funny thing here is Susan asks Reed, she's like, what do you think, Reed? Like, do you feel any different? He's like, actually, I feel like I just just became less intelligent. <laughs> but all across the city of New York, right, Queens, these different places, that you have these arguments that are going on between couples, right, between people. And as they engage in these arguments, as soon as this power is given, suddenly it's a series of like introspection. Well, I'm saying this to you because I am actually feeling this way, but I'm not telling you I'm feeling this way because of, you know, and so on and so forth. It's people kind of coming to terms with what they're really thinking and then voicing what it is they're really thinking. Not only that, it's people becoming genius geniuses like in the boardroom, offering solutions that hadn't really been given before, right? Throwing out these things like carbon-based nano quadrator that atomizes the hydrogen into particles of energy. And I don't even know what that means. But the thing about this is that people are basically just incredibly intelligent. And this is a really, really interesting concept because what this does here is it's Tony Stark showing up to the world and saying, I am not going to make the world better. I'm going to give the world the opportunity to make itself better. I'm going to give people the opportunity, the means, the intelligence to improve the world and to make it a better place. And so it's a genius idea because what you do is you effectively box people in, right? You box humanity in. You take this section of New York and you say, okay, with everybody becoming more intelligent now, if this place doesn't get better, it's because people don't want it to get better. Because with this level of intelligence, this is going to have to lead to compromise because people will realize, okay, my particular solution won't work perfectly, but maybe a blending of five solutions will will, right? Just things along those lines. Now, of course, the funny thing about this is that at that moment, you basically have Big Wheel who just wakes up out of a coma, right? Now, as far as I'm aware, Big Wheel ended up in a coma because, you know, the events of Deadpool and the Mercs for Money number four. I don't really know a whole lot about this guy. I mean, the guy's literally driving like a giant Big Wheel through the city of New York, right? Just seemingly causing all kinds of, of crazy commotion and pandemonium. And it looks like he's just using his intelligence to engage in like some villainous schemes. Of course, the entire time this is going, Going on, Iron Man is effectively being yelled at by Patsy Walker, like, are you really sure that this is a good thing to do, right? I mean, you're basically taking what you deem to be the right thing to do and then imposing it across the world and so on and so forth. But then, like, Big Wheel basically gets their attention. And this guy is just, like, running through and causing all kinds of crazy things. And the funny thing about that is, like, like Patsy Walker's, like, is Big Wheel typically a technologically organized maniac wielding selenium encoded infrared signal beams and, you know, I... I understood some of those words. And like the response of Iron Man is like, no, he's usually just a guy in a big wheel. <laughs> and here's the funny thing about this is that once they finally catch up to him and once they finally stop him, they realize that while he does shoot Patsy Walker in order to make her get out of the way, which is a, a kind of a dick thing to do, it's a villainous thing to do. Iron Man, of course, brings the whole thing to a halt and then realizes that what Big Wheel was doing was solving the problem of traffic issues in New York. He was solving the problem of gridlock, right? Like he literally fixed all the traffic problems in New York City, that people can basically travel throughout the entirety of the city as you would in a normal place, right? In a normal location. He says, hey, this guy just solved traffic congestion. That's truly groundbreaking, man. 
<laughs> that's a pretty big deal. And so it's one of those funny things is because this is how some people are basically going to use their powers, right? And so as a result of this, what you get here is Patsy Walker screaming at Iron Man, right? And where Iron Man's trying to plead the case and saying like, look, like what I'm doing here is working. You're welcome. Like, what else do you want from me? Her response is how about some foresight? The world doesn't simply become instantly better just because we all think like you do now. And of course, that pisses off Iron Man, who in turn says, even with the incredible capacity of my mind, you whimper with small-minded doubt. I will fix this entire world. Just watch me. And in that moment, Patsy Walker's like, there's nothing to do. And so Patsy Walker basically just walks off. And so as a result of this, she goes to the only person that she really can go to. When you're dealing with someone with just incredible levels of intelligence and power, only one man is is capable of bringing that person down. Someone of equal intelligence and equal aspirations for high levels of power. She goes to Victor Von Doom and says, you need to be the one to bring Iron Man back down to our level. To, well, in all honesty, you need to be the one to stop Iron Man from trying to fix the world. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.